Hello, and apologies for being completely out of schedule at the moment. If you want to know the reasons why, you can listen to the CPP cast episode I've just recorded with Rob and Jason. I'll put a link to that down below. This video is about C++ containers and how they can make your programs more flexible and how they can make you a more fluid programmer. Arguably, in this age of modern C++ programming, understanding containers thoroughly is vitally important. So let's get started. I'm sure that by virtue of watching this channel, most of you are familiar with the order of a program. It's a sequence of instructions, and those instructions operate upon data. There's all sorts of different instructions. We've got loops, we've got branches, but all the time we're operating on different pieces of data. As the program becomes larger and more sophisticated, we start to see that some data is related to others. And as programmers, it becomes quite inconvenient to have all of these disparate separate pieces of information. And as program designers, we strive to organize our programs and our data in such a way as to make working with them both effective and flexible. Whereas the program structure can be influenced by good practice and following design patterns, typically we group data into meaningful categories. So for example, this data and this data and this data, they're all red. And in contrast, this data, this data, and this data are all green. Individually, this red and green could be the type of the data. We've seen that as integers and strings and custom structs and classes, but often we also like to group data together, particularly if it's of the same type. Since the dawn of time, we've called this grouping of similar data arrays. You should be quite familiar with an array. Here is an array that holds 10 integers. In this case, we're telling the compiler at compile time that A is an array that must hold 10 integers. And so when this program is run and it gets to this point, memory to fulfill the storage requirements of our array is allocated on the so-called stack. In contrast, we could allocate this memory technically at runtime by using the new keyword, and this is allocated on the so-called heap. When we allocate memory like this, we must remember to free it up. But when it's allocated on the stack, we don't need to free it up because as soon as this goes out of scope, well, the structure of the program will free that up for us. Regardless, the trusty array has been with us for many, many years and has been time proven as the best form of container for all data types. Well, let's just consider that for a second. Is it really the best? What is an array? When I've declared an array like this, my program is requesting 10 spaces in memory sufficient to store integers. This means that somewhere in our memory, a pointer is created called A. And if you recall from my what are pointers video, a pointer is just a variable that holds a memory address. We know the amount of memory required because we've told it we want 10 elements and each one of those elements must hold an integer. Well, an integer in C++ is four bytes. So to store one integer, we would need four bytes. Arrays also have to be contiguous. This means there can't be any spaces or gaps in between the elements when laid out in memory. This is important because it makes arrays very fast to access. If I, for example, want to access array element zero, I can take the initial pointer and to that, I can add our index multiplied by the size of the element of the array. That's easy enough. That means we're pointing to this location. If I change this to a seven and this to a seven, we have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, which points to the seventh element of our array. If there were gaps in between our elements in memory, we couldn't do this. And also tools like the compiler wouldn't be able to do many optimizations and tricks. Now, being the fat fingered clumsy programmer that I am, it's not uncommon that I would inadvertently type 17 instead of seven. In which case, we're now pointing to some memory that we don't know what it is. And that's entirely legal to do in C++. Other than indexing like this, or producing interesting pointer arithmetic like this. There is no other way to interact with an array. There's no defined interface which describes what the elements of the array are and how we could traverse them in order or how we could perform interesting operations upon them. It's just a lump of data. 
Admittedly, it's an incredibly important lump of data, but it requires a very manual interaction on behalf of the programmer. So, rather curiously, we're going to start with a container that's not really a container, but it certainly smells like one. Standard array. As has just been demonstrated, the only realistic way of interacting with an array is through its index. And I could quite happily set an invalid index to a value. Hopefully it goes without saying, this is bad. Recognising some of the limitations of this basic array, C++ provides an alternative if we include array from the standard library. So let's have a look. To declare a standard array, we create the object and we specify with a template what the type is it's going to hold. In this case, it's integer and it's going to hold 10 of them. I'll call this one B. And this time, I'm also going to try and set index 17 to be equal to six. I just compile and run this program and we'll use the debugger to step through it and see what happens. So here I'm setting the 17th element of array A to 6. No problems at all. That's absolutely fine. But if I try and set it of my standard array, it throws an error. We've got some rudimentary error handling on our fundamental array type. Curiously, after what seems like a few days, the uh, Visual Studio Static Analysis tool can also pull up these errors too. But we saw at runtime that the standard array object is looking after us. And I shall point out that only applies in debug mode. So what are the other advantages of having this sort of pseudo container? Previously with our A array, we don't know what the size is anywhere else in our program. We have to maintain its size. We've defined it as 10 here. We could have a constant somewhere described externally to our program, because don't forget this is defined statically. We don't know what the size is uh, at runtime. But now we have a standard array object, just like any class, it has methods we can invoke to interrogate the nature of the object. So we can specify b.size, for example, which will return how many elements are in the array. If we wanted to get a raw pointer to the contiguous data underneath, we can do just that with data. But because standard array is trying to emulate what is known as a container, it provides other things too. An empty container contains no data. So we need to add something to it. Here's some data. One of the fundamental principles of a container is that you can traverse the container in a particular direction. This would therefore imply that the data within the container, some of it exists at the front and some of it exists at the back. So if I take my standard array of 10 elements that we had before, we know how these are lined out in memory. There's some contiguous memory allocation, but our container allows us to abstract away from that. And we can define one as being the beginning and one as being the end. This allows us to create a special object called an iterator. And iterators are really just a way of identifying one of the elements in a container. So let's say we wanted to initialize some of the values of our array. Traditionally, we could create a for loop. And in this for loop, we know the size of our array. We just calculate the index and we index the array directly, setting it to some value. Well, since we're using a standard array, we can be a bit smarter about this. We needn't hard code in the size, we can interrogate it. We could also use iterators associated with the container. Now, this will get a little bit wordy. Here, I define an iterator, i, and I set it to be the beginning of our container, and I'm going to increment that iterator until we reach the end of our container. The iterator itself is a bit like a pointer, so I can set the value that the iterator is representing to, well, our something. Now, this is quite a mouthful. Now, fortunately, in modern C++, we have the auto keyword to handle that for us. Using iterators like this is useful if we have different begin and end iterators. Perhaps we want to work on a smaller range of the full array. But in this instance, and more often than you think, you typically operate on the whole array at once. So fortunately, there is some syntax shortcuts just for doing that. I call these little auto for loops, but they are known as a ranged for loop. It knows that it will automatically iterate through every item in the container. Because the array is emulating the container interface, there is something else we can do too. The algorithm library provided as part of the standard is absolutely nuts, and it's full of all sorts of bafflingly strange functions. It's really worth a look, and many of those functions are designed to work on containers. 
So by exploiting containers, we've gone from something that's inherently unsafe and very inflexible to something which is proven to be safe and flexible, but also less code and easier to read and understand. Containers also support initialization via initializer lists. And I personally find initializer lists are very descriptive when trying to read the code. They're also great for situations where you just want to set up some data which you'll be referencing later on, and you know that that data is not going to change. And containers, as we'll see in the rest of this episode, have a variety of advantages and disadvantages, depending on the circumstances in which they're used. Arrays are great, but they suffer from one big problem. We need to know the size of them in advance. This can be quite a limitation, so we'll see that the rest of the containers are able to be dynamic in size. And the first container that people go to, and we use it a lot on this channel, is Standard Vector. The unfortunately named Standard Vector is often the source of confusion for new C++ programmers, because you naturally assume that it is somehow related to an XY coordinate. It is not. But instead refers to a structure, or a container, which is like an array, but can grow in size when needed. Yet again, here is our memory, but this time there are other things in it which don't necessarily belong to us, we can't touch them. When we declare a standard vector, we only specify the type of data that it's going to store. So in this case, it's going to be an integer. We don't specify a size. When this vector object is created, well, it's got to exist somewhere, so it's given a pointer that represents the start. Because it's a container, we add things to the vector using the pushback or in place back functions. Recall that containers have a front and a back. So pushing to the back of the vector, well, that puts it at the end. So as we start adding integers to our vector, it starts occupying the memory. And the nice thing is, these are contiguous. So if we have our vector here defined as A, we can index our vector just like an array. And we can read and write to it. But let's keep adding more and more integers to our vector. So the vector is growing in size each time. And here we hit a problem. We can't keep growing and remain contiguous. And being contiguous is vitally important to a vector. That's what gives us this fast indexable access. We can access any location with minimal overhead. So what can it do? Well, it can identify that it can't expand anymore. It's got to go and find some memory, which is larger than the memory it currently occupies. That's okay. So it copies the entirety of its contents over to this larger space. And then as the user start adding more elements to the vector, that's fine, it can grow again. Now, big problem here, and it's one I've pointed out on the channel a couple of times before. Let's assume just for a second, you had a pointer to one of these vector elements, and then you added some stuff to your vector and it was in copied in its entirety to somewhere else in memory. Well, of course, this pointer is now completely invalid it's pointing to junk. So what we can assume is that when we add things to vectors, we can't assume that any pointers to the vector remain valid after the fact. However, if we know that our vector is never going to change in size, then this is perfectly acceptable too. And in fact, you can initialize a vector to a known size to begin with and treat it just like an array. Now, I've created a completely silly program to try and explore what these containers are doing behind the scenes. And to be fair, this program is a perfect example of why containers exist in the first place. They're there to avoid needing to do lots of pointer arithmetic and black magic. So if looking at some of this syntax is scaring you off, don't worry about it. It is not relevant in order to use containers, but might appeal to those nerdy enough to worry about how they work behind the scenes. So I'll just quickly run through this bit of code. I've got a small lambda function here that rolls a die. It returns a random value between 1 and 6 inclusive. And here I've created my container. I've called it vector, and it stores integers. By default, I add one dice roll to my container, and then I start doing strange things. I grab the pointer to where the first element of the container is when the container was created and an item added to it. And I also create an incredibly wordy duration because I'm going to record how much time it takes to add an item to that container. Then I sit in a do while loop. Each time I'm waiting for the user to press the enter key in the command prompt. And each time the user does press the enter key, we're going to add another dice roll to the container and we're going to display its contents and various aspects of the memory associated with that container. 
things to note here is that we're using iterators of the container, we're using the size method of the container, and we're using these little auto for loops to iterate through all of the items of the container. So let's take a look. To begin with, the program will automatically add one dice roll to the container. Here it is, content 6, and we can see that the memory offset from where the original is created is 0, and the offset of this particular element from the start of the container is 0. This is to be expected. The vector hasn't moved in memory, and we're looking at element 0 of the vector. So let's press the Enter key. Well, adding in another dice roll, a rather rubbish random number generator, admittedly it's another 6, uh, well that took 3 microseconds. But what we can see here is that the offset from the start of the container has remained contiguous. We've got element 1 and element 0. But where it exists in memory relative to when the program started has completely changed. Let's try again. Well here we've added a 5. We can see that the vector has remained contiguous. It took 3 microseconds, but yet again the entire vector has moved in memory. Add another element, it's, well, this random number generator is rubbish, and the odds of us actually going back to where we started is quite remarkable, but hey-ho, there we go. It took 5 microseconds, but this time it has copied the vector again. We've added another 6, this random number generator truly is terrible, but the whole vector has moved in memory. Now, this time, rather curiously, we've added another 5, but we can see it only took 1 microsecond. The vector itself has remained contiguous. The order of the elements is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But if we look at the previous iteration, we can see that the memory addresses are the same as the memory addresses this time. All we've got this time is an additional 61 at the end. So this is telling us it didn't move the whole vector in order to add this one element. Let's add a few more. This time it did, 5 microseconds. This time it didn't. And here it didn't again. This time it did move everything. And this time it didn't move everything, didn't move everything, didn't move everything, but this time it had to. So the predictability of the time requirements of the vector is, well, somewhat unstable. Vectors don't grow element by element. That would be too inefficient. Instead, it makes an educated guess that actually if I'm having things added to me, then maybe I should grow by four or five elements this time, and maybe next time it'll be ten or twelve elements. The actual policy of growth is determined by the implementation. So this is why we see on certain insertions into the vector that there is basically no time overhead at all. So standard vector is the, probably the most useful jelly bean container that we have. It's great for random access and indexing. We can access any part of the vector uh, and we know predictably how much time that's going to take. The downside is that we don't know what's going to happen when we add things to the vector that can become quite unpredictable, not only in terms of time, but also anything that we've got externally that's relying on the data in the vector. However, if we initialize our vectors at the point of creation with a specific size, we can treat them just like arrays, which is a very useful thing. Next, we'll look at what we can consider to be the opposite of a vector, standard list. In the standard library, a list represents a doubly linked list. And when we add our first element to the list container, it gets put somewhere in memory. Each element in the list is associated with a node. Unlike the vector, we can add things to the front or the back of the list. So let's say we push to the back of the list another integer. It goes somewhere else in memory. There is no guarantee of anything being contiguous. And it creates another node. That node holds the value that we're storing. And so in our case, it's probably going to be an integer. The nodes are joined together with a couple of pointers one that points to the node that immediately comes after it, and another which points to the node that immediately precedes it. So let's add a third item to the back of our list. Again, it gets allocated somewhere random in memory. The memory could be filled up with all sorts of other things, so it just has to go and find some space that's appropriate. And again, we create some pointers. Adding things to the front of the list is just as simple too. It goes and finds an appropriate place in memory, creates the node, and updates the pointers. In fact, we can keep adding and adding and adding to the list, and we know that the location of the thing in memory is not going to change. It doesn't need to. It just finds available memory each time we add something in. 
If we remove something from the list, let's remove this item, which removes this node, well, our pointers effectively just join together. So insertion and removal from lists are very cheap to do. There's no reorganization of memory like there was with the vector. However, one of the problems we have got is identifying how many things there are in the list. The only way we can work this out is to go to the front of the list using our begin function and count the individual items until we get to the location where there is no next node. With a vector, we could determine the size instantaneously. It's stored as part of the vector. But with the list, we have to iterate through all of the items. And of course, with a large list, that's a lot of things to iterate through. We also have no way of directly indexing the list. We can't use brackets, for example, to give us the address of a specific node, because there's nothing contiguous about a list. We can't perform that calculation. So the only way to get to a known node in your list is to walk the list from the beginning or the end. So lists are useful if you're frequently adding and removing things to them, but don't need to access them in a specific way. We can use the same program as before to analyze the list. All we need to do is change the type of our container. Because containers share this common interface, everything else will just work. Let's take a look. So here is our list, it contains one element, and the address of that element is zero. We add another element, it took two microseconds, so no time at all, and gave us some memory address, 56. And as we add elements, what we see is that their addresses never change, but the cost of inserting the element is also always very low. It's a shame that there isn't a data structure that has the insertion speed of a list but the indexable speed of a vector. Well, actually there is, and oddly it's called a double-ended queue, but I call them a deck. Standard deck represents the point where containers go from rather trivial implementations of data storage into a more sophisticated hybrid structure. Rather crudely, one could consider a deck to be a linked list of arrays. Each of these blocks represents a small array of information. Well, it's the elements that our deck store. It could be a very small number, such as four or eight elements per block. Therefore, if we wanted to add something to the back of our deck, it needs to make a decision about either creating a new block and inserting the element at the front of it, or using up the existing space in the block at the end. Likewise, for inserting something at the front of the deck too. Unlike the vector, and just like the list, this means that there is no requirement to copy the contents of the deck, should it run out of space. Inserting something into the middle of a deck can incur some overhead, but it stops as soon as it's finished copying the contents of the local blocks, i.e. it doesn't need to relocate its entire contents in order to satisfy that insertion. A deck also contains an index, which does the required calculations to convert a direct access index like this, n, into the correct location required, depending on the block and the element within that block. This means that decks actually have a significant memory overhead before we even start to use them. So whereas a vector and a list, well, they contain nothing, just a few bytes, a deck does actually require some setup in advance. But once it's set up, it does allow us this random access indexing. It's not quite as fast as a vector because it has to go through these calculations and lookup tables, and a deck has very cheap insertion at both ends of its container. And just to show that a deck will fit into our program, let's include it here. And again, all I'm going to do is change the container type to deck. Let's iterate through the program for a few steps. So we're now filling up the first block of our deck. We can see that the items are contiguous. But now we've got to this fifth item, they've started to fill up a different block. It looks like the block size for this particular implementation of the deck contains four elements per block. So the standard deck seems like the wonder container we should all be using, and there's probably some truth to that, but just remember that to index an element in the deck is twice as costly as that of indexing it for a standard vector. The next two container types are a little different and don't necessarily fit the mold that we've seen so far. We're going to look at set and unordered set. 
In many ways, the standard set is analogous to its mathematical counterpart. It is a set of unique objects. So whereas the containers we've seen before are just glorified massive data stores of some description, a set does actually imply some rules onto what contents it can contain. And in principle, this rule is it can only have one of any particular type of item, i.e. they must all be unique. So let's include set into our program and change our container type. We have to make a few changes here. As we can see, Visual Studio has highlighted some errors, and that's because the set doesn't have a front and a back. In fact, alongside only containing unique objects, the set will also sort the objects too. So instead of pushing to the back, we simply insert items into the set. Let's take a look this time. Now, our rubbish random number generator may actually prove to be quite useful. We know that it's going to generate sixes and fives for the first few entries. Our set to begin with contains one element, six. Well, we know that the first random number it generates is another six, so our set still only contains one element. Then it rolled a five, and it contains the two elements. Then we know it rolls another five, but it still only contains the two elements. As we were trying to add non-unique elements to the set, it didn't take very much time at all. But adding a new element to the set that was unique took more time. The set needed to rearrange its contents. If we keep pressing the Enter key, eventually we get to the point where we've filled it up with all of the possibilities that our system allows. It's a six-sided dice, so we can only store the numbers one to six, and we can see that they're stored in order. That's because our set is sorted. Another useful property of the set is that the items within it are always in the same place in memory. Alongside set is unordered set. Now, if we don't want the set to be put in the correct order, whereas we saw before it was one, two, three, four, five, six, we can actually gain some performance. We saw that typically it took six to eight microseconds in order to add items to the set when they were new. By not worrying about the order of the items, we can insert items into the set and retain its properties of exclusivity, but on the whole perform faster. And in this case, we saw that we never really went above five microseconds for the insertion, but the contents of the set is not in order. I find sets useful when the user is collecting lots of data all at once and they may have duplicates of data. For example, if you've got an array of tiles and you want to select a whole bunch of these tiles as they're waving the mouse cursor around, you can just simply throw those tile coordinates at a set and let the set do the heavy lifting of working out whether it's a duplicate or not. The final pair of containers I want us to look at today are the map containers, and these don't necessarily fit into the mould like the others. Like set, we have map and unordered map. Unfortunately, one of the things I can't do here is just change the container type. And that's because maps are fundamentally quite different. We can see it's thrown an error here. A map requires two types specified as part of its template. Typically, maps are used to store key and value pairs. And so the first argument in the template is going to be the type of our key. And I'm going to be a bit different and use a string. We can see now that Visual Studio and the compiler is just unhappy with a lot of the code that we've got here. And that's because maps use another layer of typing above what they're fundamentally storing. I've moved to the end of the program here to talk about maps because I can upload this file to the GitHub afterwards. And for now, I've just commented out the preceding program. As I mentioned, maps are just like containers in terms of having a beginning and an end, but they are used to create a correlation between one type and another. For example, I could map the word one onto the value one. And I could create a mapping for, well, as many different words as I like. Just as before, I can iterate through all of the items in the map. But there's a slight difference in this instance. The type returned in this case is actually a standard pair. Where the first element of the pair is the key value and the second element of the pair is the, well, value value. Let's take a look. Well, this was an unordered map, and we can see that it's actually stored things 1, 2, 6, 3, 5, 4. Yes, it's certainly unordered. 
If we change that to a regular map, it's, well, it still looks rubbish. It stored things in, well, what order is this now? Well, it stored it in alphabetical order because that's how it knows to compare the key values. So here we've got the F, S, O, S, T, T. So yes, that is now stored in alphabetical order. On the whole, but not always, what we will see is that map and set will perform slower than their unordered counterparts. This is because the unordered counterparts hash the key value or the element itself in the case of a set, which is a way of creating a unique identifying number from the data that's being stored there. It's far quicker to do things with a large, unique number than it is with a complex data component. It becomes even more complicated when you need to sort things, because you need to see is one larger than the other. And that can mean all sorts of things in the context of set and map, and the objects that you're storing within them. In this video today, I've shown very basic types that are built into the standard library, strings and integers. If you're using your own custom objects, then you will need to provide special utilities that actually perform the equality and the comparisons of your objects. The compiler certainly has no idea whether your custom struct is larger than another custom struct when it's trying to evaluate the order that they should be stored in those containers. So this video has been a whirlwind look at the containers and why they're useful and why knowing about them will make you a better and more fluid programmer. Anyway, if you've enjoyed this video, a big thumbs up, please have a think about subscribing, come and have a chat on the Discord, I'll upload this file to GitHub even though it's not that useful. And I think the next video will be the next part in the networking series. Until then, take care.